Because my ADD will kick in, and Neil's going to be talking to me. Maya's going to go like this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> What's Neil saying on the TV? <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait, he's in front of me. <laughs> okay, well, we're back at our Coastline Connect podcast. Uh, this morning, at the time of this recording, this is summer of 2021. And we're here with Ethan Jago. Jago? <laughs> Jago. I said it like five times. You did, right before we started. But now I got yeah. it, Ethan Jago. Um, so, Ethan, you and I recently met, like mm-hmm. within the last year. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in the last year, but not new to our family. I mean, you kind of grew up with my brother, Sadly. Ryan. Sadly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit about that. Like, how did how did we get to connect? Or like, um, I know you were in Pensacola for a season as a child. Yeah. Maybe just tell us a little bit about who you are and how you got connected to us and why we're sitting next to a surf service, you know, surfboard, or um, just a little bit about who you are and how you got connected to us. Yeah, I grew up uh, in Cantonment. My dad pastored a church out there, and uh, we went to Aletheia. That's right. Uh, and yeah. so that's when Ryan and I connected, and this was under the hype of Supertones. And <laughs> I, I still have this one photo of it's me, Ryan, and a couple other guys were wearing our our suits. And yeah? Yeah, anyway. So, so is this yeah. like junior high, or how old no, would this you This was, been? I want to say third grade. Third grade. Third and fourth out grade, I think, okay. yeah. So that's when OC Supertones yeah. was like in the heyday. And so that's how I came to know Ryan. And then my sister okay. uh, knew uh, now Ryan's family. Uh, Schweiger wife, family. The Schweiger family. Yeah. yeah. And so like we've kind of known each other that way. And then I used to surf all the time too mm. uh, with uh, some of the uh, other Spencers as oh, well. Okay. Um, Sterling and then yeah, Ryan and yeah. some other people. But then we left my eighth grade year. Okay. My dad went to pastor church in the Philadelphia area, okay. uh, which he's still been there now. Still uh, there to this still day. there, yep. Oh, wow. So we left in 2000, uh, and then he's still pastoring uh, to this day up there. Uh, went through ninth to 11th grade, and then I was an exchange student to Germany. Uh, so I studied in By Germany. By choice? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. I, I love foreign languages, okay. and uh, I wanted. I got accepted to go to this small city in Germany oh. called Allen. It's outside Stuttgart, so southwest Germany. So you, how old were you at that time? I was uh, just turning 18 almost. I was 17. So you yeah. went to private school, at least in your elementary here in yeah. Pensacola, and then when you moved to PA, what kind of school was that? Was that so a I private? went to a private school there. Okay. Uh, my dad's church had one, your so I finished church. up eighth okay. grade there, then I went to one year ninth grade at another Christian school, and okay. then I went to a public school. Okay. Just because the opportunities were yeah. bigger for what we were trying to do. Or How did you learn about do. this foreign exchange opportunity? That's not yeah. everyone's story. It yeah. was in the it was in the high school, the okay. German class I was in, we did a, a two-week trip to Germany, and then we came back, and they said, hey, we do this year exchange huh. between these different locations around Europe, and our high school is huge. I mean, we had like 3,000 people. Okay. So it's a big high school. And so they said, if you're interested, apply. So I applied, then I got interviewed, questioned. I had to go through several different like evals to see if mentally I could take it. And I got accepted. So they paid my way. They hooked me up with a host family. And then I studied uh, my 12th grade year in the gymnasium over there. What is that? Uh, That's their, so their school goes up to the year 13. Okay. So it goes up to 13th grade. And so it's a gymnasium, which means like there's, uh, there's the Hochschule, so like a high school, then there's like a trade school, then there's a gymnasium. So gymnasium is for people who are most likely going to go to the university I see. after. Okay. Uh, so it's a little higher level education, which was... Wow. The learning level for that was extremely high. Yeah. yeah. So you're like 18, 17 at yeah, that season? Yeah, 17 turning 18. And did yeah. you graduate high school in Germany? So I, I, I finished up high school there, but then I flew home f- okay. to walk at my high school. Okay. And then six months later, I joined the Air Force. Wow. So do you still know any German? like I do yeah. yeah wow it's 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 rough yeah um, but once I get it going again like it, it comes okay. back yeah so right now currently even at the beginning of this conversation um, you're currently serving at a church in Pensacola one of the largest yeah. and probably long-standing churches in Pensacola Olive Baptist you're the young adults college pastor there mm-hmm. but before all that we kind of pick up with graduating from Germany and stepping into the Air Force um, was your family? Did you have that in your background? I mean, what led to this desire to serve? And what was that like? It's, uh, I don't know. It was just growing up, my mom wanted me to go into ministry. Yeah. But I saw how hard ministry can be. Because you died. Yeah, because of everything that I saw happen with my dad. And I said, the last thing I will ever do is go into ministry. I don't want to do it. Mm. I'm, so I'm not going to. And so I thought, you know, I always, you know, growing up watching these old war movies and everything mm. else, and I'm always seeing pushing yourself to the limit to see what is it that mm. I'm capable of. Mm. And God put that desire in me to to just go out and see. So I remember I walked into a recruiter station 
originally I was going into the army hmm. uh, and I went through all the process and everything else. But then my mom, I remember this clear as day. I came home. I'm like, well, I got accepted to the army. She's like, well, who doesn't? Oh. I was like, well, I mean, really? I thought I, I, I thought it was hot stuff. I got accepted <laughs> to the army. And uh, she wow. begs me crying, please don't join the army. Look at the Air Force or something oh, wow. else. And so I, I, when I walked in the recruiter station, it was 2004. So I okay. mean, Iraq is full fledged. Yeah. And I wanted to get involved because yeah. September 11th and everything else, if sure. nothing else re strengthened my resolve to go in. So I go, I don't want to fly planes. She goes, just please talk to the Air Force recruiter. So I went into the Air Force recruiter and I didn't think anything highly because all my friends that I knew were in the Army. I said, all right, what, what Air Force jobs do you have? Uh, and she goes, well, what are, you, what are you interested in? I said, I want something that's going to push me, something that you've never had anyone walk in or someone that's ever passed. And she handed me a VHS cassette tape. And uh, th this is, again, this is 2004, right around there. And she hands me this VHS cassette tape. And I'm like, what is this? So I put it in and it's this video of this guy with camo running around the woods in Vietnam, uh, talking about evading capture and then mm. training people uh, to resist torture and then how to mm. escape and survive. I'm like, okay, this looks pretty sweet. I yeah. enjoy the outdoors. I love the beach. I love the woods. So I signed up, shipped out uh, to join as a SEER specialist. SEER stands for Survival Evasion Resistance Escape. Wow. Did that. Uh, went through selection course after basic training. I passed that. So we started with about 60 guys on the selection, and we graduated about 15. Okay. Uh, then I started my team, uh, 0701, up in Spokane, Washington. Mm. And we started with, I want to say, 80-something, and we graduated 30. Mm. So pretty high attrition rate. So the job of that is to train individuals in survival tactics, uh, with the understanding of like, hey, guys are going to get shot down. Guys are going to get cut off behind enemy lines. We got to give them the skills to survive mm. in these environments, uh, mm. not just survive, but maintain your body temperature and everything else. But mm. then also they're going to have to evade capture. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the enemy's going to be looking for them, especially in the height of Vietnam War. I mean, that mm. was just all the time. Mm. And then if they get captured, how can they resist interrogation? How can they resist all this other stuff? And then lastly, escape so that they can return home with honor. Mm. And so that was like the sole job. And then another byproduct of that that we do is as we're doing training and everything else, we do refresher training is we deploy and we do personnel recovery, uh, mm. planning, uh, and helping commanders execute, hey, this is what we have, this is what we can offer uh, to, to bring our, our people home. So if mm. a, a helicopter gets shot down, we provide guidance because we've trained these guys and this and that, and we're an advisor to the commander to mm. help him out in making the decision. So how long did it take from going from being the kid that went from the Army to the Air Force to start really deploying some of that knowledge, education, and training in real life. Like, how long did that take, your training? And then yeah. how long did you do the job? So the the full training pipeline, uh, just to get your certification is six months, but then there's an additional instructor certification because we're, we're trained educators sure, from right. uh, Air Education Training Command, so that took another six months. So I would say total... Solid year, uh, at least. About a year minimum. Beyond ba basic training. Yeah, beyond that, basic training. Yeah. But then to be operational, to be able to deploy, that's probably in a, another year or two. Okay. Uh, and I and didn't basic know. training lasts how long? <clears throat> it's changed. Oh, we just lost We, we lost there. the light. It's changed. So when I went through, I can't recall, I want to say it was like eight weeks or something. Okay. But I think now it's more. So over two years of training mm -hmm. before you're ready to kind of um, engage in the, the job description of training and helping exactly. individuals. Exactly, yeah. So then how long did you do that job? So I did that for 16 years. Wow. Yeah. So I did that for 16 years, moving from Spokane, Washington uh, to Fairfield, California. And then I taught at the Army Airborne School at Fort Benning, Georgia for a while. Wow. And then I finished up at Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Okay. And that's where I got out as up there. So a lot went on, I can only imagine, uh, spiritually, physically, emotionally, relationally, mentally, in that 16-year stint. Yeah. Um, number one, thank you for doing that. I mean, we are only able to do things like this because of guys like you and so many more men and women like you that serve. So, I mean, living in Pensacola, you know, the cradle of naval yeah. aviation, Air Force just to the east of us with Hurlburt and Eglin, the Marines, to go north, you get to, you know, what is it, Whiting. I mean, we're surrounded Tons. by so many men and women who serve or that go into contract work post-service. Mm -hmm. So I think it's such a unique area because we have the beach, you know, that's beautiful. But then we're also blessed with just some of the best humans you'll meet because they serve. And now that you're in ministry um, in, the, in the way that you are, I don't know if this has been your experience, but my experience, the, the men and women that Uncle Sam brings to serve 
And if they're Christians and they want to be a part of your church, there's some of the best volunteers, some of the best individuals to serve in a church because they they understand service, mm. they understand structure, they understand like how to faithfully see something through to the end. Yeah. So it's so interesting being able to serve in ministry in an area like that. Um, and I can only imagine, and we could probably spend another three podcasts on, <laughs> what was that 16 years like spiritually, physically, emotionally, relationally, mentally? But um, if you were to kind of summarize or just share on these two points, during that 16-year season, I'm assuming you got married during that season, at some, yeah. but just to the job, what did you enjoy and what did you endure? Like, like as two polar opposites, like in this draw, job, in this role, this is what lit me up. This is what I loved. And then this is what I loathed. This is what I endured. Um, I mean, we all have that, no matter what it is. But I can only imagine in your position, it's a bit to the extreme, you know, that which yeah. you enjoyed, that which you endured. So I don't want to ask you to go into details that you don't <laughs> want to go into, but just it's interesting because we don't get an opportunity to really... There's no way for me to know experientially what you know. I know maybe in theory. Oh, that's right. probably what... But um, to walk through it experientially, that, there's only a sense of fellowship and commonality and friendship that can come with those that you've walked through that. But I'm sure there's one, two, or three individuals who've served in the military that are mm -hmm. that are uh, maybe taking this content in. For your experience, highs, lows, enjoy, enjoy or endure, or love or loathe, however you want to identify that, can you share a little bit of that uh, without... Yeah diving into it too much. But. Well, first, what the Lord used this as an opportunity to show me that I was not saved. So mm. in that year training or whatever, it was towards our last training iteration called Integrated. And in this, we thought we were done. We were supposed to be graduating in December. Okay. Uh, December, I'm just going to throw out a number, 15th or something. Sure, yeah. So it was like December 12th. We had just finished up. We get on the bus and the instructors hit like we're all going home we're singing the song semi-sonic closing time and all, <laughs> me and all my buddies were super happy we're like we're That's done yeah. they hit the bus everyone get out and we, we get this pep talk and we're like yeah yeah we, we were done we're done and then he goes all right you guys are about to start your solo night for x amount of days and we're like oh man so we 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 wear these short like pt shorts mm. this is in the middle of winter in mm. spokane washington we had to strip mm. down to that and they gave us this really thin flight suit, like a painter suit. They gave us a doled out knife and a few other things. And they gave us a huge laundry list of things to do. And they said, this is going to go on until we're, we're satisfied that you guys all have what it takes. Hmm. And so it was out there by myself in the middle of the woods. That I was getting everything done. I was tired. I was hungry. I was frustrated. I was fed up that God brought to light the way I was living my life during training before training Basically, as even when I was in Germany, mm. there was a slow drift mm. away from what I knew to be true, the mm. way that I was raised, and then what I was doing. Mm. And God, it was like, I, I explained this to my young adults, is like God took a dump truck, backed it up, hit that lift gate, and just dumped all my sin in my lap. Wow. And it was, what are you going to do with this? Mm. Rationalize this for me. Mm. And that was when all this other verses that everyone had poured into my life growing mm -hmm. up as a kid just started to flood into my soul and into my mind, which is a beautiful illustration of the regeneration of how mm. that precedes faith. And it, as all of this was going on, I broke down in the middle of the woods and I gave my life to Christ and realized that I was a Matthew seven twenty one self-deceived Christian. Mm. And it wrecked me. I would, I, I don't really get emotional or cry. I was crying out in the middle mm. of the woods mm. where God just wrecked my soul. Mm. And, but then after that, he restored me, he brought me back in. And mm. then now I knew what my purpose was. My purpose mm. was to live on mission for him. Mm -hmm. And so uh, where am I going with this? Well, one, I wanted to quickly annotate that because I thought I was as a Christian, but it wasn't until I was 18 in the middle of the woods mm. Uh, that God's like, you're not a part of me, man. Mm -hmm. You may have led people to Christ. You may know all these answers, but you're not a part of me. Mm. And so what happened, the hardest part for me was that transition because of all the things that I had been doing. And like, I, I was not a nice person. I, mm. I was, I had kind of made a bad name for myself because I was a selfish sinner doing whatever I wanted, however mm. I wanted. And I had some buddies that, praise God, have we are now really good friends now, mm. but like I wanted nothing to do with Not them. I was time. the most yeah. egotistical, arrogant, mm. narcissist uh, because I just wanted my sin. But then mm. that, the new person, I, I had already dug my grave, mm. and it took years for me to unpack that for people to see that 
there is a change. Mm. And it wasn't like a 180 where everyone's like, wow, Ethan, you're different. No, mm. no one, a lot of people didn't want anything to do with me. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, and so that followed me for a, a decent amount of time mm. uh, because people thought that I was playing a game, sure. messing with the system, sure, but yeah. this was genuine, effectual change. And so the hardest part for me was dancing this fine line, and I, I, I say dancing, but it's really not, is where is it and how is it that I do Christian living playing out in the military? But then also I, I'm not proselytizing. I'm not being overbearing with it. But mm -hmm. at the same time, I'm being bold, mm -hmm. you know, because we know we're supposed to be bold for Christ. We're supposed to be proclaiming the gospel. But what does how do you how do you play that? Mm -hmm. And w the way that I started to do it was building my relationships with the individuals that I was working with. And then as I'm working with them, as I'm talking with them, as I'm building life with them, I just bring th things up. Mm. Uh, you know, and so that kind of started the gateway into what I'm doing now mm. is just talking, asking them questions, figuring out what they believe, why mm -hmm. they believe that. And I mean, if it's a person that you're talking with, like when you and me hang out, you're not just sitting there jawing on the whole time. Mm -hmm. You're asking me questions. I'm sure. asking you. Yeah. We're learning from each take. other. Yeah. 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 And so that would I say would was kind of the heart, one of the harder things, not including, I mean, there's many other things of being away from family and everything sure, else. Right. Um, but I would say the best thing I had was. And I didn't realize, I didn't come to this epiphany until a few years ago, actually, that I love to be an educator mm. and I love to teach. So mm. I going, remember you saying that recently. Going, yeah. yeah, going through our, our, our training, we go through an education system in which we're taught how to teach. Mm. And I remember thinking, why am I ever going to need to use this? Mm. I don't want to do this. I, I mm. want to be doing all this cool, jumping out of airplanes and diving and this and that. I don't want to teach. But that's our job. Our mm. job is to teach people and mm. see and. God laid the way, and then there's a an education program through Southern Illinois University that happened. So mm. I, I got my degree, my undergrad and bachelor's in uh, workforce education, mm. which is adult learning and developing a mm. training system and pipeline and stuff like that. And that to me is the best, is when you're teaching somebody a concept or a skill, and they're like, it doesn't work, I don't get it, and then all of a sudden you see that light bulb go yeah, off. Yeah, sure. That to me was worth yeah, it. Yeah, that's what lights you up. You yeah. know, and yeah. so... There was guys uh, where I got my call to ministry. I was in Iraq. I was teaching these Iraqis. Uh, we we're doing mission planning. We we're doing mission prep because we we're about to go out uh, and rescue some Yazidis from Mount Sinjar that ISIS was just destroying these people. Right. And so I was brought up into Erbil and we were, I was doing some training on these guys on basic uh, map reading skills, uh, personal recovery stuff and everything else. And I had several translators and we were working. There's a couple other Americans we were trying to figure out how to plan this out because these guys it, it was like the wild west uh, mm. they had these mi-17 helicopters we'd be talking 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 they say okay guys let's go do this and they go out on the helicopters we weren't allowed to fly with them and then they're in their helicopters and then they go and do it come back and they're like oh well we were getting shot at and this is what we were doing we're like so it's like on the fly learning mm -hmm. and then as you see light bulbs clicking in their heads for mm -hmm. where they're now doing uh being proactive in what they're doing before they head out that to me was like the biggest yeah most invigorating yeah. and rewarding you're seeing the fruit of it right there as you're encouraging teaching yeah. educating coming alongside and it's interesting you mentioned kind of even that challenge of um well kind of people seeing that new life that you experience play out over time i'll, I'll never forget um when i lived in destin i church planted yeah. in destin so that area, we got to encounter a lot of military, uh, specifically from the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I'll never forget reading the headline, Captain America uh, dies by, by suicide. Mm -hmm. And there was a friend of mine named Andy Marciano, who was just a, you know, a decorated serviceman, um, who navigated some of the same things that you mentioned about um, just having such a challenging dynamic, allowing his faith to be authentic mm -hmm. amongst his peers, amongst his subordinates, or those he would report to. Um, and Andy had, you know, different challenges in his life that unfortunately led to him taking his own life. But I, I spent many conversations over burritos, you know, in Destin with Andy, and um, just appreciated and respected him. But it was interesting of all the things that he would navigate in the role that he was in. What was often most difficult on his heart and on his mind was what you just mentioned, mm. was that spiritual dynamic of yeah. trying to bridge that gap, trying to help even just be seen and known for who he truly was, not necessarily the persona, not necessarily yeah. the, um, the dynamic of his job description, but what, what he valued most was who he was in Christ. And so it's interesting that you shared that because Andy's the only other individual I've ever come across 
that had kind of that weight. And when, when, you know, as a pastor, if you're meeting with someone who serves in a very high stress level job, be it in an emergency room yeah. or on the field of battle, the anticipation is the conversation is going to come from some of those experiences or some of those residuals, you know, the, the stress thereafter. But every time I met with Andy, it was more about who he was in Christ and um, trying to navigate that, you know, in that military service world. Um, and you dance that fine line too, Neil. Mm-hmm. Is uh, it's so easy to get your identity wrapped up into what you are what doing you do. in the military? Yeah, uh, you know, especially within our career field. Like to me, we got we get to go to all these fun schools and all this cool stuff that you get to see in movies. And now I'm doing it. And now right. I know this is who I am. Mm-hmm. And then I have to constantly be remind. I have to remind myself, no. This is where God has put me. This is where God has placed me. But this does not define who I am. Yeah. And what was interesting, it wasn't until I separated out and then I started going into full time ministry that that really came to light that my identity was truly still wrapped up in Mm. my military service. Mm -hmm. And uh, someone posted something. I, I can't remember who did it, but it said, uh, no one cares who you used to be. Mm. And when I read that, I'm like, fair enough. Mm. Like, fair enough. Like my military service compared to other people's is nothing. Mm. Absolutely. Just a, it's a joke, honestly, compared mm. to what other people have done. And I'm like, why am I using that as like mm. who I am when mm-hmm. really the thing that's going to maintain me through all of this is my identity in Christ. Because mm-hmm. if I'm constantly looking at my identity in the military, I'm always looking into the past because right. that's who I used to be. That's who you were, yeah. But I'm consistently and always am in Christ. And so I need to always be looking forward into where I'm going with him. You know, I don't know if you've ever read that book or watched that movie recently that came out on Rich Mullins. Um, Mm -mm. There's a book by Brennan Manning called The Ragamuffin Gospel. Um, Interesting book. You know, I'm not saying I'm purporting everything that's in the book. I'm just referencing it. But uh, in the movie that they do on Rich, um, you know, Rich was a guy that had an influence on contemporary Christian worship in the Mm. 80s and 90s, died in a car accident, but struggled with addiction all the way through Mm. it to alcohol and had an abusive dynamic with his father and all these different things. But one of the questions that this uh, pastor asked Rich was, are you free? Hmm. And his immediate response was, well, what do you mean? And the the pastor said, well, obviously not, because a free man would not need to ask Define your define terms. That. Yeah. He knows if he's free or not. Yeah. And I say that to say this, that you know, work is the platform through which we worship, not the platform by which we define worth. Mm. And this is a dynamic that all of us, we balance that tension. I don't think we ever solve that problem. It's not like, okay, I've defined it. I'm not, I don't need to worry about that anymore. Because our culture, what you have accomplished defines your value, worth, or ability. Oh, you can't speak of that. You've never done this. Or you can't oh, write yeah. this. Or you can't you know, speak to that. Um, but unfortunately that leads to so much, it's like strangulation of your peace, of your serenity. But until you find that identity in, in who I belong to defines who I am, then I'm free. You know, I, you know, you're able to have a conversation and not worry about where they thinking this or this or this about me, or if I step into this situation, are you free? Because the one whom you worry most about, you already know what he thinks. It's in black and white or in red. You know, it's in the Bible. And so I think that's so helpful because, you know, an individual like yourself, um, or any individual, it is a challenge not to identify by anything other than who I belong to and who bought me. Um, Because accomplishments or accolades or roles or responsibilities, they come and go. Yeah. You know, they come and go. And if you define yourself, I have a a dear friend who's accomplished in 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 a sport. But, um, and he found his identity in that for a few years. Um, but then he had children, and now his children are, are grown to, for the most part. And he said, I'm having the hardest time with this. Hmm. This was my identity. I was their dad. Yeah. And not that he's still not, but they're grown. Now they're married or they're moving or whatever the situation is. And so I do think this is a tension to balance, not a problem to solve. But in ministry, and this is where I wanted to kind of pivot kind of from your military background to where now you're serving in ministry— This is a huge challenge for men that do, women that do what we do, serve in full-time ministry to some capacity, to think that, well, I know what I'll do. I'll join the ministry, because that's where (laughs) I'll really fall deeper in love with Jesus, or that's what will really feed my soul. Or I I have a friend who often said, you know, ministry's a mistress. Sometimes she, she doesn't produce what she promises, 
it's intimacy with Jesus that leads to yeah. effective ministry. But it's it's so very easy for me, and I can't speak for everybody, but for me and some of the friends I know, to find our identity in what we do for the Lord rather than what he's done for us. Yes. Um, so I wanted to speak a little bit about your transition. I mean, it, thank you for sharing about that story when you were 18, because that kind of gives a lot of clarity of yeah. why would a guy leave a position like you have? You do all this interesting stuff to to go teach the Bible to some college kids or something. <laughs> like, why do that? It doesn't make yeah. a whole lot of logical, linear sense. Like, yeah. So that pivot for you, why, why step out of the role you were in and now you're involved in ministry and, I mean, you and your wife both in different yeah. ways. So tell us a little bit about that, like how you met your wife and how that pivot from from military to ministry and what's going on now, I guess, because it's, it's interesting. It, it is, and <clears throat> the reason why I said early on, too, that I never wanted to go into ministry uh, th- that's going to be a point of clarity I'm going to bring up in a little bit. But I met my wife in 2008 mm. on Facebook. Mm. So this was back when only college students had Facebook. So right. I had a friend of mine create an EDU account for oh, me okay, yeah. so I could get on it. So my cousin posted some photos. Uh, my wife was going to school at Clearwater Christian College. Okay. And I saw these photos and my cousin was hanging out with this girl, now my wife. And oh. I'm like, Oh, she's kind of good looking. Like hanging out like he was dating her? No, no, my my female cousin. (laughs) Yeah, my female cousin. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, let me clarify that. (laughs) And so I saw these photos. I'm like, oh, she's she's pretty. Yeah, you're attracted to her. seems like she's a Christian. So I hit add friend, and then I shot her message. Hey, I'm, uh, this is is Kaylin's cousin. You know, I just saw you, thought maybe we could talk. And then I also called my cousin. Hey, give me the scoop. You know, is she dating? Is she single? And she's like, oh, well, she's free. You know, she's a good Christian. And then. On the back end, after we got married, Diane was like, yeah, I remember that phone call because when she hung up, she came to me, looks like my cousin's interested in oh, you. Oh, wow. So anyway, fast forward. I was in Spokane, Washington. She's down in okay, Clearwater. you're doing your training. Yeah. yeah. She, well, at this point, I was already done. Oh, you're already done. Okay. Yeah. So Diane is down in uh, Clearwater, Florida, going to Clearwater Christian College. So mm. you want to talk about long distance relationship, yeah. which honestly was like the echoing of the rest of our marriage while I was in the military is oh, we were so yeah. distanced apart. But it was cool because like we had this time to build our relationship on communication because that's all we had. Uh, this was when Skype had just now come out. I mean, there wasn't FaceTime or anything mm-hmm. else like that. So we were spending time on Skype. Mm-hmm. We were spending time on the phone. Mm-hmm. And we were learning how to just communicate, pure communication. You know what? Can I pause on yeah. that real quick? I didn't have nearly the challenges that you had with that kind of long distance relationship. But my wife and I have been married 14 years at the time of this recording. Um, but right when we started to get to know one another, I moved to Oregon for a three-month training. And the, the kind of training that I was in was a bit monastic, not in a very, like, we didn't wear robes, even though I'm kind of wearing a robe <laughs> right now. But, like, we, we weren't permitted to have a device or email yeah. or, or even phone calls. So the way that we got to know one another was through handwritten um, Old school. snail mail yeah envelopes letters the whole thing which is fun which is fun but it's also interesting because not a lot of people have maybe that dynamic that you just mentioned i like the way you termed it our relationship was built on the foundation of communication Mm -hmm. um we had that same dynamic but the challenge was it wasn't as immediate like it would be Mm -hmm. like i'd write and then like it's been a week so yours is communication and patience and patience (laughs) yeah which i guess with six children you know we learned like oh you got to have that you've got a lot of that yeah a lot of patience um (laughs) but i didn't want to derail but i just found that man that was a good way to phrase that our our relationship was built on the foundation of communication which as you stay married you learn another tension to balance not a problem to solve like constantly have to invest in your communication with one another but anyway, sorry, that was just no, sprung to no, my you're mind. Fine. Yeah. yeah, no, it, you're exactly right. And so we built off of that, and obviously the Word of God too. So we did all these little other things where she sent me a one-year Bible and she highlighted things, hmm. counted down the next day. So we got married in 2009. 2009. Uh, she came up uh, to Spokane, and then fast forward, we had our first kid in 2010. Wow, Then our yeah. second kid, 2013, and then our third kid in 2015. Okay. Um, so that's kind of through our life in when we in 2014 we did diane and i talked uh, my wife loves photography graphic design we did wedding photography for a while in california oh, wow. um, and then she goes ethan i love writing i love taking photos and i love designing things i wish there's a medium in mm. which i could do something that incorporates all of these mm. and i was like well pray about it see what happens you know and so she came to me and she goes i think i want to start a christian women's magazine mm. uh, that incorporates all my talents mm. And so at the job that I was working at Airborne School, my hours were horrific. Mm. Um, 
I was having to get there sometimes at 2.30 in the morning and I wasn't getting home till 8. That wasn't all the time. But for the most part, I was having to be at work around 4 and be home around 6 or 7. So, like, mm. my ability to help out with things was yeah. very minimal. Yeah. Um, but she, so we decided to do a Kickstarter campaign. Mm. Uh, and we, we produced this magazine with a bunch of contributors and friends that we have mm. in ministry. And we tried to hit an all or nothing goal of $14,000 or no, I think it was 13,000, but the Lord blessed us and did a thousand dollars over that. Mm. So that's when we started Deeply Rooted Magazine. Mm. Uh, was in out of our home in Fort Benning or outside Fort Benning, Georgia. Okay. And then God has just multiplied that over the mm. years. And we have just seen such incredible growth because the whole reason why we wanted to do this was there's so much fluff out there for women uh, mm. in, in regards to theology and practical living and these unrealistic expectations that women were seeing through social mm. media. And my wife says, I want to combat that to point back to biblical womanhood mm. uh, and to show women what, you know, how you can be loving Christ and no matter what aspect of life you are in by mm. honoring your husband, taking care of your household and taking mm. care of your family. And so we have everything from you know, DIYs to mm. practical theology to keeper of the home. Is it solely a print product? So, is it uh, online as well? How does so it work? So it's print. Okay. Uh, it's print, and we've ran 15 issues. Wow. Um, but um, we're, we're going to we're, we're transitioning into something else, which okay. we haven't released yet. Okay. Um, but we still have magazines and stuff like oh, that. Oh, cool. So that that's kind of how that happened. That's amazing. That. And what year did that start again? So that started in t- 2014. Wow. That and then amazing. my wife published a book recently with mm. Life or with B&H Publishing called mm. A Holy Pursuit, mm. how the gospel helps us to free us to lay down our dreams or to hit pause or because uh, that's something my wife was struggling with is mm. she's like, God's put these desires in my heart. I want to do what I need to do for him. But mm. how do I do that? with also honoring what he has given me as Mm. a husband, giving me a husband and giving me kids. Mm. And so she wrote this book more of, it's like what God was teaching her, but as Mm. an encouragement for other women as well. Right. And so she wrote that book um, uh, through B&H and that's available. When did that come out? That came, that came out in COVID. So we, that the Lord is just humbling us even more, which is God's just, if I could say what has, he's been teaching us this past two years is, God's sovereignty over every single thing in our lives mm. is, you know, when a when it's your first book, there's like things you got to do, you mm. know, as that book launches. Mm. And so we were going to have a book launch party. We had all this other stuff, but then COVID shut everything yeah. down. Wow. So we got the book sent to us in our home as we're taking pictures with them, like, yay. Mm. And then, Not you know, at that time yeah. too, books weren't being printed as much because of uh, all of this other stuff. Mm. So it took a huge hit mm. and was very disheartening mm-hmm. uh, because, I mean, she spent all this time sure. and everything else. And then now it's like, you know, but if anything, it's been teaching us, hey, if God wants to give growth, he's going to give growth. If mm. God wants this book to be a success, God's going to give this book to be a success. And so what she and I realize is if one person is edified or encouraged by this book, mm. it's a huge success. Mm. Uh, and so it's just redefining our terms of mm-hmm. what mankind views as success and what Christians should be viewing as success in mm. light of the gospel, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so that is kind of that dynamic. So with deeply us. rooted is the name of the magazine, mm-hmm. and then the name of the book is a holy pursuit. A holy pursuit. So yeah. where do people find that information online, or how do they get access so, to that content? Yeah, deeplyrootedmag.com dot com. Okay. Uh, or uh, a holy pursuit, which is my or dianjago dot com. That's okay. her website. All right. And uh, I mean, you can order it on Amazon or Anywhere books are Kindle, available. and they yeah. even have. It was cool. We didn't realize they, there was an audio book. Oh, uh, so it's on Audible as well. Oh, and what's cool. cool is I love Audible. Yeah, me too. I, yeah, I think yeah. when you've talked about this, I do the this. credit subscription. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And I listen to a lot of like sci-fi books. Oh, one of my favorite narrators narrated my wife's oh, book. Oh, wow, that's cool. And I was like, as I started listening to it, my wife's like, "What? What are you listening to?" I'm like, <laughs> "I'm listening to your book." Yeah. <laughs> She's like, that's awesome. "I've got an audio book." Wow. It, it, was, it was super. That's cool. interesting that the author wouldn't be given the communication that hey, we put you on Audible. Or... <laughs> Hey, we're not complaining because it yeah, was cool. Yeah, I mean, it's not a, not a bummer in any yeah, way. Yeah, oh, so it's on Audible as well. Um, so that's kind of my wife and I. We've been married 12 years. 12 We've got years, three kids. Three children. Yeah. Uh, 10, uh, 8. They, they all just moved up a year. So I'm, I'm Yeah, yeah, I get yeah. that. So yeah. 10, 8, and 6. So during your military career, your wife um, navigated the same challenges that so many. I mean, my sister um, yeah. married an F-18 pilot yep. with the Navy. So that that is such an amazing heavy responsibility it is um but during that time she kind of began to dip her toes into ministry to where now it's a full-fledged magazine a full-fledged book then for yourself i mean Mm -hmm. obviously you're part of that whole dynamic 
But when and how and why and when did you kind of transition from I'm no longer serving in the military to what you're doing yeah. either now or to steps you took to get to where you are So now. that that timeline with Diane and I brought us up to uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, so we moved up there in 2015. Uh, and then I had a deployment into Iraq 2015, 2016. And it was over there that I had a general call to ministry in 2010. I knew mm. that God wanted me to do something. I mm. didn't know what it was. That's I, post that like 18 year old in the yeah, woods. Yeah. So alone 18 the in the woods knife, was 2000, yeah. 2006. Mm. I'm at 2010. And at this okay. point in time, I've been reading, I've been studying, I've been growing. God's been shifting and landing me on my theology and how I interpret scripture and how mm. I, you know, where I think and how I view life. And then in 2016, I was reading a book, Am I Called? Hmm. Uh, I remember you sharing that. Yeah. yeah. And now that's a book that I love to give young men yeah. in our ministry of, I think I'm called. As I was reading that book, again, let me remind you, I wanted nothing, nothing to, to do, do with, with ministry. Yeah. So I was thinking, maybe he wants me to be a chaplain. Maybe he wants me to do this, but I'm not going into the local church because mm. I've just seen the toxicity that can happen. Mm. It was like a sledgehammer to the chest mm. uh, in which God's like, you're going to go into teaching pastoral ministry. Mm. And so it was after that that I immediately started seminary. Uh, through, while you were still in in the military? Yeah, while okay. still in the military, because I used tuition assistance through the, awesome. the Air Force, which yeah. paid for an associate's degree, a bachelor's, and started me out on my master's degree. Man, thank God. That's it, awesome. It was, it was great. And then the, yeah. G, the GI Bill, once I got out, yes. paid for the rest. There you go. So, I started my master's degree while I was still in. Uh, so I started at Liberty. Then I transferred to the master seminary, oh, yeah. uh, John MacArthur School out there. Yeah. But then there was some, uh, they weren't super military friendly back then. Okay. Not not friendly, but it was very yeah, just difficult the way the to get everything done. Registration, so then yeah. I switched back to Liberty. Uh, I finished up my MDiv. And then I got out uh, and I started doing some contract work on the side. But then... With this contract work, I didn't have to be in the military. And like, we didn't have to stay in Pennsylvania anymore. Yeah, you're flexible now. And I had a uh, a job offer out in Hawaii that my wife and I were like, well, this could be cool, but it's not really where we don't. And this is what's interesting that God's been showing me is God will give you the desires of your heart, right? But where do those desires come from? If I'm truly walking with God, those desires are going to come from God. Mm -hmm. And how do we delineate between my desire and God's desire? Mm -hmm. My selfish desire did want to go to Hawaii. I, I, why would you not? It's a Wahoo, sure. right? Yeah. You know, then you play, you know, economics and stuff in your head. But Unless then, you want to buy a gallon of milk. Yeah, gotta... <laughs> it's just, I mean, yeah, we did look. So that definitely had teasing, weight yeah. to it. But at the yeah. same time, though, my desire ever since I left Pensacola was to come back to Pensacola. And that has mm -hmm. just been consistent my entire life. I wow. never knew why. I could never put my finger on it. So Hawaii or Pensacola, you'd say Pensacola. Yeah. And wow. Well, my wife and That's I That's got to be God. It, 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 I mean... <laughs> Truly. Yeah. Uh, but no, because we had to make this decision for Hawaii to, yeah. because the job closing and we had two nights to pray on it. And I mm. said, I don't have a piece. I don't have a piece mm. about Hawaii. And so we said no. And then she goes, well, if you could live anywhere, where would you want to live? And I said, mm. Pensacola. Mm. She said, so why aren't we living there? Mm -hmm. So within two weeks of us talking, we were down here in Pensacola. When uh, was this? How long? This ago? was in 2019. Now. 19. And so we rented the house and then I was still doing contract work uh, on the side because that was my full-time job was just doing contracting. Uh, and then we started to attend uh, a church, but then I met up with a good friend of mine that I knew from back at my dad's church in Cantonman. Mm. And we, we went and grabbed coffee and then he walked me into Olive's campus at Warrington. Mm. And I just sensed God wants me this at this campus, yeah. at, at the Olive Warrington campus. So we just started attending mm. uh, with zero intentionality of anything. Just, hey, if there's one thing I've learned, and I'm sure you can relate to this too, is God's going to direct your path where he wants mm. you to go. And as long as you're just stepping out in moving. obedience, yeah, yeah it, it, it may not be what I think. Right, yeah. You know, because when we moved down here, I had zero intentions of, right. like, I, I knew that I was called into preaching and teaching, but I didn't know how. I didn't know where. One of my mentors once told me this. He said, Neil, in ministry, what you're called to, um, it'll never be what you thought, but it'll be greater than you ever could have dreamed. Yeah. Like that, you, you got to, I mean, I think a plan, I say this a thousand times, probably said it on this podcast already two or three times, but a, a plan is a great tool, but a terrible master. <laughs> and so you have to have like roadmark, we're moving, we're moving. Yeah. But then Sally hits or COVID hits or a baby comes or whatever <laughs> the situation is. And blessed are the flexible, you know, they will not be broken. Like you've got to learn to pivot and perspective is that which usually changes a thriving leader to just a surviving leader is perspective. How do you see this? Is God in control or is he not? 
Absolutely. And what are you going to hold loosely onto? And what do you just hold firmly yeah. onto? And um, I think that dynamic of, I don't want to fill in the gaps of your no, story because no, no. I know what you're doing now, but it's interesting to hear like, oh, I meant Warrington to now what yeah. you're doing now is interesting. Yeah. Just well, how God leads. And what's cool about all this too, Neil, is I'll back up is when we were in California, my wife and I were leading a middle school ministry because the interim middle school pastor wasn't there yet. And so that was when we first started to get really involved in ministry. Okay. And then when we moved up to Pennsylvania, uh, I knew that I was called into teaching, right? And so I started, I, I went up to the church elders. I said, hey, I've got this call to ministry. Is there anything that I could teach? You know, I've already been in seminary for a while. So they gave me a hermeneutics class to teach with only one mm. person showed up uh, uh, for, yeah, that. for six yeah. weeks. But, yeah. and that's when God was like, if you can teach to one, yeah. you can teach to a hundred thousand. That's know? right. Yeah. And, but it was there. Then they said, hey, Ethan, we need someone to teach our young adult ministry. Would you go and offer up teaching? I was like, okay, sure. So I went over there and I, I spoke and I talked to them and then the church came up, say, Hey, Ethan, will you be, uh, not, not employed or anything else, but will you be our young adults leader mm. under the headship of the youth pastor that this kind of fell underneath? Mm. And so that's what kind of started to get me into the young adults ministry. Mm. How long ago? So that was in 2017, 17, okay. 2017 is when that was happening. So then now we're at Warrington, we're attending, uh, we we're attending a class and one of the leaders of the class said, Oh, Ethan, you you've got a seminary degree. And I was like, well, yeah. He's like, would you mind teaching every now and then? I was like, hey, however I can help and however I can serve, you just let me know. Mm -hmm. So I started to teach. Uh, and then the Olive Main Campus, uh, two of the main guys met my wife who was helping with photography and everything else. Mm. And it's so funny. I tell Diane, I go, without you, Diane, no one would ever know who I was. I've been riding <laughs> off your coattails, uh, our whole marriage in which people know who she is. Mm -hmm. People have heard of her and this and that. And I'm always like that husband in the background, like, go on. You're the trophy. Yeah. Husband. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Kinda, yeah. So she's talking to them. She's like, oh, you got to meet my husband. Mm. And they go, okay, well, you know what? Oh, he, he, he loves apologetics. He mm. loves theology. He's got a seminary degree. He's got a call to ministry. So then John and Sean Pillay from Olive took me out uh, and they started talking to me and they, they heard my heart. And then they just, uh, it, it just is so weird. And they're like, Hey man, would you want to come and check out our young adults ministry? Mm. Uh, the, or the college ministry is what it was called then. Mm, okay. And so John Huff was the main guy for that. And I was like, yeah. So I, I went and I saw that and I'm like, Oh yeah, this is, this mm. is, these are my people. Mm. And so, but that was his position. Mm. Uh, and I just said, Hey, I'll help you out however I can, you know, I'll come mm. up and be a leader with you. Uh, but it's obviously your ministry. I'm right. not going to overtake that. But then, they were trying to transition him from, <clears throat> I mean, he was juggling so many hats, mm -hmm. but they were wanting to transition him from the college pastor to be the education minister. Mm -hmm. And then that's Which I when, think I met him when I toured yes. the campus with you. And I actually went to school. With his sister. Yeah, with or no, his sister, with his, wife. his wife, with his wife, or someone yeah. that he's connected to. Yeah, it's a small world. It, yeah. it really, yeah, it's, that's Pensacola. Yeah, that's Pensacola. That's Pensacola. Yeah. But then, so that's, they, after, so they brought me on as a pastoral resident for a bit, a uh, bit of time just uh, to kind of fuel me yeah, out. Yeah, I to guess see you know one dynamic. another. Yeah. And then at the end of that, they, they offered me, hey, would you want to come on and be our full-time college and young professionals guy? And so which we prayed about and we we stepped away. I stepped away from the contracting world mm. to go into full-time ministry. And that's kind of what's mm. landed us here is mm -hmm. just uh, God putting this unrest mm. in me because that's the thing is like, Martin Lloyd Jones and a lot of other guys have said, like, if you can do anything other than pastoral ministry, go and do it. Right. I never will forget uh, Chuck Smith. We were speaking about him before we turned the <clears throat> yeah. podcast on. He was my men's discipleship teacher when I was in Bible college. So Chuck would come and teach our men's discipleship. And he had that same sentiment that if you can go do something else, please go do it. Yeah. Because um, calling is what keeps. It's not the fun or the I have chemistry with this person or I really love this endeavor that we're doing or I just love the people. I mean, who doesn't love the people, but God brings people in and out. I mean, like we're in the 21st century. You're not born, bred and dead in the same church or the same location. You move, yeah. you know? And so like um, the thing that you must hold on to is God, what have you told me to do? And I don't move till it's done. Absolutely. And then once it's done, then I, I'm I'm done. Like there's that release, you know. Well and that's that is being led by the spirit, you right. know. Is that is like I won't be a second anywhere longer than where God wants me to be. Right. You know? And that's the thing, is like I had this turmoil from you know, in the contracting world, post-military, you make really good money. Sure, yeah. Ministry, obviously you're not doing it for the money. So there's no. like a huge thing. And I could have done lots of other things. Like it right. was very easy for me to just continue doing yeah. what I was doing. Had those opportunities, but yeah. 
when we were praying about it and thinking about it, the, the problem was, was like, I did not have a peace. And right. that just always has been how right. the Lord spoken to me. And I can't do anything else. Like, right. I, I, I I want to be uh, discipling and pastoring and pouring into these young adults. Right. Because uh, that's, that's where God has put me. Sure. Uh, and then, you know, I, I'm going to do that as long as God wants me to do that. And I think that's what kind of had our you know, lives intersect just within the last yeah. nine or 10 or 12 months, however long it's been, because you had a heart for a conference, you know, and yep. then share us a little bit about, it was the first year, this yep. last, when, when was the conference? What was you know, it? It what? was, it was, so it was this, it was March of March this year. March of this year. So okay. I took the position at all of, uh, at being the young adults guy, uh, August of last year. August. Okay. <clears throat> so August of last year, and God gave me this vision of, uh, what if you were able to unite as many churches as you can together to show one uniformity like, hey, you know, we may have denominational differences, but sure. there's major things that we all are 100 percent in agreement on. Mm -hmm. And we do this for the young adults where we provide a venue for these young adults, because after COVID, it, you know, a lot of yeah. the different things weren't happening. So sure. we put on an Oxano conference Oxano. and we partnered with several different churches. And Oxano is the Greek word from Acts chapter six, verse seven to increase. Mm. Specifically, we want to see the name and the word of the Lord increase mm. in increase in the reason for making disciples. Mm. And so that's when we launched Oxano was this past March. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's when I came to you and said, Hey, cause I used your brother Ryan yeah, to shoot Ryan, the great promo video. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then I wanted to see, hey, would Coastline want to come in? Mm -hmm. You know, have your young adults come in sure, and this yeah. and that. Um, and it was like a weekend conference, yeah, Friday, it was a Saturday. Friday and Friday. Yeah, it was a Friday night and do a Saturday. So what? How did that go? I mean, first year, ten, ten people showed up, or like, what no, did you do? Yeah, we it went phenomenal. I it, it was uh, we we charged seven bucks. Yeah, uh, and with that, you, you've got you know swag bags, some other stuff. But the big thing was was it was a local conference spoken to from local people. Yeah. Um, I don't think we Which I can't have think to. of one recently, <clears throat> like, you know, that kind of yeah, style. I, mean, why do I, I understand it's great to bring in another perspective. I'm not sure. pushing back on that at all. Sure. But it's like, you know, why can't we just do it from, so they see these are your local these church your guys. people yeah. pouring into the local city. So it went really well. Mm. Um, for us to pull this out, it was tough. Mm. Uh, a lot of Last minute changes, a lot of sure, last minute brand things, new. but yeah. yeah, but for the first conference it went well. So we had our Friday night session and then we had breakout sessions everywhere from personal evangelism to personal discipleship, finding your purpose. Mm. Uh, we had different local ministries setting up tables there too, because I mm -hmm. wanted like it to be like a vendor booth to get yeah. these. My wife and kids involved. and I, we had a, a friend in town from Santa Barbara that yes. week, yeah. but we had an opportunity to stop by on Saturday and it was neat to see different churches, different ministries, different parachurch ministries. Um, kind of all under one roof, and then there's the Chick-fil-A truck, which you can't go wrong with that. Can't. Krispy Kreme and the other place. So it's like you hit all the things, <laughs> yeah. and then you're real close to UWF, which I think is just a phenomenal yeah. asset of where all of is located, as is Hillcrest and other churches, Liberty. And I just think it's, I'm so thankful that you guys are there. Um, because, you know, I once heard it said that the most prime time to sow the seed of the gospel is when someone is under tension or in transition. And I don't know of a more prime time for that than post high school, college, when you're like, I'm trying to figure yeah. out. So to be able to have beachheads there, like Olive or Hillcrest or Liberty or whoever's there, um, or BCM, Parachurch, mm -hmm. whatever it is, linking arms, you, you'll go further together Absolutely. than you will alone. So yeah, and, and what we wanted to see too is what we, what we were noticing is some of these students were coming up like, oh, well, I go to this ministry mm -hmm. on another night. Hey, that's fantastic. If, mm -hmm. if God's feeding you through this guy, then mm -hmm. you need to be going there. It's to show everyone we're not in competition with each other. Right. We're, we're, we're all moving towards the same end goals. Right. And make right. Fully devoted followers of Christ. Like yeah. that's our purpose and that's our goal and our mission. That's awesome. Um, and so that's kind of how it landed of where I'm at now uh, is our, our ministry is called Crossroads. Uh, right. It's a young adult ministry. So we're everywhere from 18 to 34 year olds. Okay. Um, we meet on Tuesday nights through the semester. Uh, yes. at 6.30, and then Sunday mornings, we meet Sunday mornings for our Sunday school group as well at 9.30. On the campus of All the Baptists, mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. So if someone's interested in finding out about the weekly during the semesters of school, uh, how do they, online, where do they, like, locate your information? So we do, we have an in-house newsletter that we have okay. where people, if they sign up, they get the newsletter, but then also our social media is probably the easiest, easiest way to thing. put out info. Yeah. So Crossroads at Olive is our okay. Instagram, and then I'm actually wearing our yeah, logo. Yeah, you got the logo. Yeah. So that, just look for that, and that, that we put out our information uh, through that as well. Okay. So, uh, man, thank you for kind of walking us through uh, a little bit about who you are, what you're passionate about, what yeah. you do. 
And um, thank you for the contribution to the local church. I mean, thank you for your investment in our country, you know, through service. Um, and just kind of as we kind of land our time together in this conversation, like for you, is it brownies or cake? Which would you better, more prefer? If it's dessert time, where do you land? This is a very serious question. It depends if there's ice cream involved. Oh, yeah, that's true. If there's ice cream and the brownies are fresh, then brownies and ice cream. Brownies are what you're If learning. it's just birthday cake, then just birthday cake. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I had my, my daughter, my daughter's uh, oldest daughter is Lily Jane. Lily loves baking. So I think two birthdays ago, three birthdays ago, she's like, Dad, what kind of cake can I make you? So let's make up one. Let's make up the Neapolitan. So let's have Funfetti, Red Velvet, and yellow with chocolate icing. And that thing is the best thing. I would eat that all day long. That has nothing to do with anything we've talked about. But speaking about just life and family and that kind of thing, um, you know, a healthy marriage is something I was told my dad, my dad always used to say was one of the best things you can give your kids is the example of how well you love your yeah. wife. So when you and Diane are doing date night, like what does that look like for you guys? Because that can be a challenge for people in ministry to just kind of like still continue to see marriage as that primary. But what is like family night or date night? What do you guys like to do for fun? Yeah, I mean, um, what is your what is the well, family Jago? What, what, Jago? Jago. I keep getting it wrong. well. One thing that God showed me early on in our military is, as much as I can, my family had to come first. But in the military, I don't have that option. And, but one thing that I did realize is that when I'd be gone for a while and come home is we would invest so much time into our kids and to each other. Uh, but now that I'm in ministry and I am home a lot more, family always comes first. Mm -hmm. If my family's not in order, one, I'm disqualified from service, right? But two, if my family's in order, it makes me and allows me to be better at what I need to That's do. That's right. Yeah. So my family's always a priority. So I carve out, and you and me have talked about this several mm -hmm. times, I carve out my schedule uh, mm -hmm. of when I'm accepting, you know, granted I'm always available, sure, but my family has to come first. So right. every Friday night we have family night. Okay. Uh, and so that involves pizza, a movie, hanging out. Um, but then also there's certain days of the week I try to get home a little early where we load up and we go to the beach and we spend time at the beach. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're very intentional that the kids see that they're a priority. The kids see that we want to be with you, right. uh, that daddy's job does not overtake this. And one thing in way we've done that is how can I incorporate my family into the job mm -hmm. is my, it's a family affair. So mm -hmm. within our ministry, my kids are there Tuesday night sitting and listening mm -hmm. and the young adults are pouring into them mm -hmm. and my kids love it because mm -hmm. growing up as a pastor's kid, we were always in the church, mm -hmm. but I wasn't involved. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, uh, granted, yeah, I was involved in like drama or this or that, but I didn't want to be there because right. no one really cared to talk to me or, you, you know, there, yeah. it was always, oh, there's the preacher's kid. And yeah, I was a knucklehead growing up, but what preacher's kid isn't. Sure. Yeah. But with my kids, it's awesome to see my kids will go up to some of these young adults. And these young adults will play Foursquare with them or they'll do, you know, just hang out and talk to them. My son brings his chess board and these young adults will play chess with them. And mm -hmm. so it's them investing in my kids having buy-in mm -hmm. that when, when we shut down during the summer, my kids are like, oh, when is it coming back, yeah. dad? That's and good. they love it. But at the same time too, they're learning Yeah, uh, is we, we do an active amount of investing in our children. Mm -hmm. And with, at dinner time, we try and take them through catechisms. We try and ask mm -hmm. them questions and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Um, but that's how we do it as a family is it's, it's in as involved as we can possibly have the kids. And what's awesome is some Sunday mornings, my kids, like we kind of rotate it of like who comes and sits in a crossroads Sunday morning. Oh, okay. But what I love though, is the investing that I've done in my kids, as I'm asking questions Sunday morning in my group, and we'll, we'll have like 60 young adults on a Sunday morning in our class. And I'll ask a question and my son mm -hmm. speaks up and he answers the question. And I'm like, looking to see who it was. I'm like, Yes, Caden, that's yeah. that's right. And what's awesome though is it, it, it motivates these other young sure. adults to be like, if this ten year old can't answer this question, why am I not answering this right. question? Sure, yeah. And we as the church need to be modeling that too sure. with these older people mm -hmm. to that yes, you can learn from the youngers mm -hmm. and youngers you can learn mm -hmm. from the olders is yeah. to break down these barriers that think just because you're older than me, right. I can't teach you anything. And just because you're older than me in a different era, I can't learn from you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's this two-way informational flow. Right, right. And so that's how we involve with the kids. And then my wife and I, uh, I would say during the school years where we really have great date nights. Okay. Or not date nights, but date days. Okay. So before I go into work, 
I mean, like clockwork, almost daily we were having breakfast together, mm. spending time together, or we'd go to our local Waffle House, which yeah. is classic, <laughs> and just spending time Pensacola, together. Pensacola, that's why you're here, yeah. Waffle House. Yeah. <laughs> but, but very intentional time with each other. Yeah. Uh, and we would do it in breakfast time, but now we've got a great babysitter. Oh, cool. So maybe once every so often she comes, and then my wife and I will go And, and I've noticed stuff. on social, too, you guys get an opportunity to travel together every once in a while, be it something for your wife's yeah. book thing or... You know, just traveling or something. However, guys... I can bring her with me. Yeah. Uh, I want to. Yeah. Because uh, even when I was in the military on certain, some of my TDY trips, some of my local training trips, if I could bring them, I would have to pay out of my pocket, but I would mm. bring the family. Mm. And so any, I just love being around my family. Mm -hmm. They're not a burden mm -hmm. to me. You know, I, I don't dread going home. Mm -hmm. I want to be around them. I want to surround myself with my family. Yeah. And so however I can do that in whatever way, and I think we have to break the barriers of like conventional mm -hmm time spent right right is like no like i remember growing up i used to think devotions with your family was the dad sit on the couch and the kids all take a knee and just stare at the dad with their big doughy eyes like speak the word of god to us mm -hmm. but what we do is as we drive yeah. it's they ask dad can you ask us bible questions right. and it's just asking well what is bible that the question. shema like you know it's like deuteronomy yes as you're going you know that's how you kind of disciple your kids because it, you make it a lifestyle it's right. not like okay now we're going to put on our jesus hat right, right. jesus that's, hats off let's go out and there's have fun. always an illustration in, yeah. under every single circumstance well last couple things i'd ask and then we'll wrap it up but um you know in ministry especially with um crossroads or exano Without giving away everything, I mean, if you're going to release things at a certain time, you got to be respectful of that. But what's kind of coming up for you in ministry? Like, what are you most excited about with the young adults or Sunday mornings? Or yeah. what do you kind of see? As, where is God leading you in um, what you're stewarding right now? Like, where are you guys headed as a ministry? How can people, what can they look forward to to jump into? So we're our building that we have our own building, but it was like a small section. But thanks to the tithers and everything else within our church, we were able to purchase the entire building mm. and it's getting remodeled. Okay. So that so way we can have cool. uh, a, a larger building to host. Because right now we're, we're displaced. Mm. We're meeting where the high school meets. And then soon we're going to be meeting in the gym because they're going to be demoing and we've outgrown uh, our building, which is a good problem good to problem. have, I yeah, guess. Great issue, yeah. Um, but this Thursday, we're starting a young adults launch. Hmm. Um, so we're going to be meeting at uh, downtown at Long Hollow Creative. So this is specifically for individuals who are post-college. Okay. Uh, or who are not in college. Right. Uh, they, they're in a trade or profession. Uh, and so we're meeting Thursday night, this Thursday night for that. And my hope is, is that when they come together, we're able to develop networks. And then my, my goal is, I'm going to be speaking from 1 Peter 2, is to launch two Bible studies out of whoever comes, mm. get a volunteer for a guy, volunteer for a girl, and say, look, throughout the week, you need to be connecting with believers in more than just a Sunday morning mm. or a Wednesday night. You mm. need to be doing this daily. Mm. All right, that's what Acts 242 is showing us, is they had everything in common, they were devoting themselves. And so once a month, I wanna start meeting specifically for the post-college mm. individuals is, have this gathering time. Mm -hmm. So once a month we gather corporately, but after that I'm they're out sending and we're doubling our Bible study groups mm. where they're going through a book of the Bible and everything else. But it's showing them like, look, you guys need to be connecting with each other mm -hmm. more than just in the church setting. The sure, church yeah. does not need to be the only thing. Sure. Like, oh, if it's not in the church, it's not happening. Right. No, we need to be doing this in our life. And a lot of them are doing it. Right. But now we're just trying to mobilize that a little right. bit more. Yeah. That's so awesome. that's what's coming up with that. Um, as well as I'm finishing up my doctorate of ministry, which mm -hmm. I'm, I'm in a nice little break right now. So it's been super. Oh, we need to at least mention that, though. That. But Battlefield Theologian, we got it. I mean, we've talked about Exano, we've talked about oh. um, Deeply Rooted, we've talked about Crossroads, but you also just launched Battlefield Theologian, a, a website. Yeah. That kind of houses so, a lot of your content. It's so I had to do that for my doctoral work. Mm -hmm. So it's ethanjago.com, but it's called Battlefield Theologian. Mm -hmm. And where that came from was I was. I, R.C. Sproul has just been mm. a huge impact on my life in theology mm. and apologetics and teaching. And there is one thing that I heard him say quite often is that he views himself as a battlefield theologian. Mm. And what a battlefield theologian is, is someone who's willing to go to war on behalf of the scriptures, mm. on behalf of biblical doctrine and sound teaching, mm. and that they refuse to allow the cultural landscape to guide and misconstrue what the Bible is mm. actually saying. And so one thing that, you know, through the apologetics world that I've been in now 
is to be able to answer the why questions that people have towards Christian faith mm. for non-believers and also for believers. Because sure. growing up, I had many of these questions that mm. no one ever answered for sure. me. And if we can answer those questions, man, I, I tell you what, we can push someone on one side of the fence or another. Because sure. if someone was asking, if I was asking all these questions growing up and I was, like, how do I know the Bible is real? Do Why does Jesus had to have been God and man? I don't understand it. Well, have faith. Well, the Bible says so. Mm-hmm. No one gave me an answer. Mm-hmm. And everyone just kept reassuring me of my salvation. No mm-hmm. one was like, you know what? Maybe, Ethan, you're not saved. Mm-hmm. Maybe you don't know what you believe and why you believe it, mm-hmm. nor was I able to articulate it. Mm-hmm. And then what I realized later on, uh, th- this is a whole other podcast, is how I really got into apologetics was I thought, this was post-conversion now, I thought I knew what I believed, mm-hmm. but then I had an English professor start asking questions. I realized, oh my word, yeah, I have no clue how to articulate that. Yes, mm-hmm. I can articulate very well that Jesus died, rose from the grave, like the gospel that we use for evangelism. Sure. But anytime that I've, I've evangelized or I've shared the gospel, I've always had people ask questions. Yeah, either philosophical or historical questions. And typically yeah. we give a cop-out answer. You just mm-hmm. have to have faith. Sure, yeah. And Christian, Christianity is not a blind leap into the dark. Mm-mm. And so Battlefield Theologian is trying to get people who want to know the wise, mm-hmm. who want to know for the reason of the hope that is within them, First mm-hmm. Peter 3.15, and also show them that Christianity is not unreasonable. Yeah, it's, it's thoughtful. It's very reasonable. Yeah. It is, and I'm not saying that we need to take this into the empirical world of, well, I've got to be able to prove X, Y, and Z, yeah. but it's a reasonable faith. You can have warrant and justification for your belief system. Mm-hmm. Just like you think that it's, and it's not just a subjective bias. Like you think ice cream is better than, or cake is better than brownies. Mm-hmm. No, there is an objective standard and mm-hmm. that's Christianity and that's yeah. found in the word of God. And right. so what I'm doing is I'm br- trying to break down, uh, high level philosophical concepts into real easy to understand ways and why it relates to your faith Mm -hmm. and how this relates to Christian living, not to get into an argument with somebody, Mm -hmm. but to make you a better Christian to root your grounds of why I believe what I believe, Mm -hmm. because if we're basing our eternity off of Christianity, how dare I not know what it is that I think? You know what I mean? Yeah, I agree. And it's just uh, trying to make illiterate Christians more literate, trying to show the whys in the house. Right, yeah, that's great. And so that's that's my goal with that is, one, I had to do it for my doctoral work, uh, but at the same time, it it was just something that I think naturally God was leading me there anyway, uh, not to build a name or anything else, just to get resources and get information out there to just show, look, we can answer the whys. Right. And apologetics is still relevant. Yeah. And it is not always having to be done in some ivory scholastic right. high level argument, but it's for the everyday common folk. Right. You know? Right. So deeply rooted, <clears throat> holy pursuit, crossroads, exano, battlefield theologian. You and your wife are just like classic underachievers. You, you're kind of lazy. <laughs> don't ever do anything. <laughs> We're jack of all trades, master of none. No, it's... But no, but thank you for those five. I mean, I think those yeah. are a huge investments. So, I mean, I know I'm just getting to get to know you and meet you in this last year, but super thankful that you're in Pensacola. I mean, I think when I first moved back to Pensacola Gulf Breeze from Santa Barbara, from the West Coast, I kind of had this mindset that, man, it seems like everyone's a Christian, but no one is. Like, there's not like this thoughtful, That's it. reasonable, hey, I am who I am. Like, at least on the West Coast, I'm Buddhist. I don't care anything about what you believe. Yeah. But here it's like, man, I do watch football. I do drink sweet tea. I go to Waffle House and I check in at church. I'm a Christian. Yep. This is who I am. That's what it means. And it's very cultural. So it's, um, you know, every church planner you talk to, they're planning the church in the hardest city in the world. Everyone tells you that. But the South is interesting because it is, um, she's like a sleeping giant that if she could just be awoken, um, the South could rise again, but in a spiritual way, you know? (laughs) Oh, man. (laughs) But anyway. Yeah, yeah. um, But man, thank you so much for sharing. I'm thankful that we're able to kind of, in our little world here with this little podcast, just able to highlight kind of these five um, platforms that you and your wife are are invested in. So I just wanted to say thank you. and I know you've had an opportunity to share, and we'll put it in the show notes how people can stay connected with you. But um, Ethan, thanks for being here, and uh, we look forward to all that God's going to do with all these different ministries, opportunities, endeavors, and initiatives. I'm sure God will bring great and tremendous fruit as you and your wife just stay faithful to one another, your kids, and wherever God places you. Thanks, so, brother. Thank you. Appreciate it.